Welcome. My name's Michael Desch. I'm a professor of political science. I'm also the Brian and Janelle Brady Family Director of the Notre Dame International Security Center. And we're one of the uh, many co-sponsors uh, of this event this evening. Uh, NDISC, uh, the center I run, tends to focus on national security or international security issues. And certainly, the ongoing Israel-Palestine conflict has tremendous national security implications, not only, of course, for the people directly uh, affected by it, but also for the region um, and the rest of the world. Um, but we were very happy to uh, co-sponsor this because even these uh, significant international security implications uh, pale in the face uh, of the political and indeed uh, human consequences uh, of this ongoing uh, conflict. Um, and it's a conflict uh, that's not only been uh, ongoing and incredibly bloody, um, but also one that it's been hard to talk about uh, in a way that produces uh, productive dialogue. Um, and so uh, when the provost tasks V and Mahan uh, to put together a series of events, uh, I was grateful to him for doing that and also grateful to them for inviting me to uh, uh, be a co-sponsor. Um, and it's also my privilege to uh, introduce uh, our moderator for this evening, uh, my colleague Lisa Shirk, who's the Richard G. Starman Senior Professor of the Practice of Peace Studies at Notre Dame's Kroc Institute for International Peace Studies, uh, which is also a part of the Keough School for Global Affairs. Uh, so without further ado, I'll turn it over to Lisa, and uh, I again, welcome everybody this evening. Thank you, everyone. May I first start by asking you to please silence your cell phones? Tonight, we'll hear from Israelis and Palestinians from the PeaceWorks Foundation and the One Voice Movement. Coexistence, part of the title of tonight's event, means living side by side with equal rights, equal justice, and equal safety for all. So we know we do not have a situation of coexistence tonight. The point of this event is to hear firsthand from Israelis and Palestinians who are both critical and honest about the current situation while holding out hope that peace is possible. Our guests say they are committed to moving a critical mass of Israelis and Palestinians to reject the status quo and unlock the full potential of both peoples. In the words of the PeaceWorks Foundation and One Voice, here with us tonight, we will learn how they are trying to combat pervasive hopelessness and dysfunctional political cultures. These taken from their website. Some believe this event is a distraction from ending the war or an attempt to normalize the status quo. This is untrue and unfair. No one here wants the status quo. We reject the idea that dialogue is useless or irrelevant. Dialogue does not mean avoiding hard issues. Tonight, we will talk about difficult issues, power imbalances, violated dignity, and humanity. At the Kroc Institute, we think that wars, we don't think, we know from research, wars end in two ways. Between 10 and 20% end through military victory, and the other 80 to 90% of wars end through negotiation, which begins with people-to-people -people dialogue in many of the history of, our, of, of peace processes. Coexistence cannot come through denial or separation or domination. Tonight, we will talk about those difficult issues. 
To start, we must be able to look at our own implicated situation here at the University of Notre Dame. So I want to offer a land acknowledgement to recognize our presence on the traditional homelands of indigenous peoples, including the Haudenosaunee, the Miami, the Peoria, and particularly the Potawatomi, who have been using this land for education for hundreds of years and continue to do so. They were removed under duress and continue to live with the impacts of displacement today. Indige indigenous people here and everywhere are stewards of the land's past and advocates of the present and future. Acknowledging these injustices, we commit ourselves here to supporting indigenous sovereignty and thriving with atonement, respect, and dignity at Notre Dame. Tonight's event is part of a year-long series uh, in the, in the Notre Dame Forum on Palestine and Israel. In the first session of this series, we learned that the Hamas massacre of 1,200 Israelis and the kidnapping of 254 people on October 7 must be understood within a much longer history, the 76-year history of Israeli domination and occupation of Palestinian homes, cities, and lands. October 7th also took place within the 2,000 year history of Christian violence toward Jews in Europe, and it reminded many Jewish people everywhere of the Holocaust. We learned in the last event that it was Christian anti-Semitic violence in Europe that drove millions of Jews to escape to what they thought, to what was then mostly an Arab region called Palestine, beginning around 1880-1900. We learned about the Zionist movement in the last session to establish a Jewish state and its use of violence against Palestinians from the very beginning to make way for Jewish refugees. We learned that neighboring Arab nations attacked Israel in 1948 and again in 1967 in opposition to the creation of an Israeli state on Palestinian home cities and land. At the last event, we also learned the terrible death toll in Gaza which has risen even since the last event. The UN estimates 43,000 known deaths from violence, and we learn from the International Court of Justice that it has denounced the plausible genocide in Gaza through both mass bombing and the restriction of humanitarian aid. In October, Brown University released its documentation that over 64,000 Gazans have died from starvation. The first session looked at the map of the region, which I'm gonna pull up here just because many Americans don't really know what we're talking about. When we say Gaza, uh, which is in the left-hand triangular, triangular corner there, or the West Bank, which is separated from Gaza. Uh, we learned that there is continued expansion of Israeli settlements in the West Bank, uh, territory set aside for a future Palestinian state. Since the last event, the U.S. has elected a new president uh, who has told the Israeli prime minister that he supports Israeli forces to finish the job in Gaza, and we don't yet know what that means. Over the last week in Amsterdam, Israelis shouted hateful comments about Arabs. Some chanted, why is there no school in Gaza? There are no children left there. In response, Gideon Levy from the Israeli newspaper Haaretz describes an ugly criminal pogrom against Israeli soccer fans. And we know that almost two dozen were hospitalized from that violence just over the weekend in Amsterdam. Gideon Levy goes on to note that similar pogroms, violent, pogroms are violent attacks. Uh, they are carried out by Israeli settlers almost every day in the West Bank. Last week, the UN warned the entire Palestinian population in North Gaza, especially children, is at imminent risk of dying. As a Catholic university committed to human rights and human dignity for all, we must denounce all of this violence and honor all of this life. As a Catholic university, those of us who are Christians are part of this story. We're not ob observers from afar. Uh, Christian anti-Semitic violence and immigration laws in Western countries closed the door to Jewish immigration. Christian Zionists used their political power to financially support the ongoing theft of Palestinian land to bring about a greater Israel, a, a condition they view as necessary for Christ's return. And it is US-made bombs landing on Palestinians and Lebanese families today. Those of us who are Christians and U.S. taxpayers are part of this story. 
We also want coexistence with equality and dignity for all at Notre Dame. We have work to do here. We want this campus to be safe for all of our students. We need to make sure that Palestinians, Israelis, Muslims, Jews, and Arab students here, that they all feel safe and they are not targeted for their political views. We need to be able to speak out as Israeli, call, as Israeli leaders are calling for genocide against Palestinians. And we also need to speak out on those who are calling for attacks on Jews anywhere. We need the ability to dialogue with each other about how our community's investments enable or obstruct pathways to co coexistence. At the Kroc Institute for International Peace Studies here at Notre Dame, we promote the idea of strategic peace building. One of the core conceptual frameworks we use is this diagram by peace scholar Adam Curl. As illustrated in this dialogue diagram, strategic peace building requires both balancing power through nonviolent social movements, including protest, and robust dialogue, deliberation, and negotiation to build awareness and trust between groups. Research shows that intergroup dialogue is an effective way to expand movement membership and develop a collective strategies that can break through the status quo. Coexistence is not possible without roughly balanced power. You don't have successful negotiations or a just peace when the parties are vastly, uh, have vastly different levels of power. And you also don't get a just peace when there is not high awareness and trust between groups. Right now, we know that power is not balanced. Israel is a nuclear state with by far the most powerful army in the region. It is, a, it is immensely wealthier than the Palestinian Authority. The US and other Western countries um, really give Israel more foreign aid than any other country and have backed Israeli policy. But Palestinians are not powerless. They have agency. They have many allies around the world who stand with them against Israeli occupation and want to honor the dignity of Palestinian lives. And for them, protest is essential to also bringing about peace. Both Martin Luther King and Mohandas Gandhi led nonviolent movements to disrupt unequal and oppressive systems. Both King and Gandhi said the opportunities for dialogue should always be taken. In their writings on social justice and social change, they believe there is never a time that dialogue is not appropriate. And both of them practice this, even when it was most difficult, as it is this moment with our guest here tonight. Dialogue alone cannot bring change. We know that because dialogue between Israelis and Palestinians has been happening for decades. To date, the failed negotiation and peace processes between Israeli and Palestinian leaders are an indication there is no sustainable outcome without roughly balanced power and a recognition of interdependence. Dialogue must be able to face hard truths, and tonight you will hear um, about the current crisis, what future coexistence might look like, and what Israelis, Palestinians, and those of us here at Notre Dame might do to support future coexistence. Our speakers will share with us their work to build the human infrastructure needed to create the conditions for a just and negotiated resolution to the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. At Notre Dame, our president, Father Dowd, has asked us to reflect on what do we owe each other? May we each think about this as we listen tonight. Let me introduce each of our speakers. Tahila Wenger is the, is the deputy director of the Geneva Institute in Israel, an NGO that promotes a peace agreement between Israel and Palestinians through diplomatic, educational, and public tools. Her work at the Geneva Institute includes organizing and facilitating joint dialogue forums for stakeholders, advocacy, and outreach with Israeli decision makers and international stakeholders. She has a BA in politics from Princeton University and an MA in diplomatic studies from Tel Aviv University. Mr. Nadel Fokaha is the Director General of the Palestinian Peace Coalition uh, and also at the Geneva Institute. Um, this is a nonprofit Palestinian organization, the, peace the Palestinian Peace Coalition, that promotes a peaceful settlement for the Israeli-Palestinian conflict based on the two-state solution as envisioned in the Geneva Initiative. Fokaha has contributed to several political dialogues, including on security, borders, Jerusalem, water, refugees, as well as reconciliation-related issues. 
Fokaha served as an advisor to the PLO, the Palestinian Liberation Organization, Secretary General between 2003 and 2008, and a team, of, team member of the Palestinian-Israeli Joint Economic Committee. Ezeldin Masri was born in Gaza in 1971. He has a degree in international relations and conflict resolution, uh, and he worked in Gaza schools as a teacher and administrator be before he became the first secretary of the Palestinian Diplomatic Corps, overseeing organizations working on promoting peace between Palestine and Israel. From 2006 to 2015, he directed the Gaza office first, and then the Ramallah office of One Voice. He returned to the United States in 2015 and is currently the PeaceWorks Foundation and One Voice Movement Chief Field Officer. And Ellen Garfinkel is also part of the team uh, as one of the organizers, and I'm going to invite her up to share a little bit more. She is the program coordinator from PeaceWorks Foundation based in Washington, DC. Thank you all for being here tonight. Thank you. Thanks so much, everyone, for being here. And thank you to Notre Dame and all the different institutes hosting us here tonight. We're really excited to be here. Um, my name is Ellen Garfinkel. I'm the program coordinator at PeaceWorks. I joined the team back in September, and I graduated college in 2023 in North Carolina. And I just wanted to give you a little bit of background about the program that we're running. So PeaceWorks has started this program called the PeaceWorks On Campus program, and we're traveling to almost 20 different universities across the country in the month of November with Nidal and Tehila, and also two other speakers in the Northeast. We're about halfway through our tour, um, and it's been a fun road trip experience here in the Midwest. But one one of the main things about our program is that we don't want it to be just a speaker series where we come once and then leave and it was just a good talk where you maybe took away something. We really want to create lasting relationships with not only faculty and staff but also students across these different universities. And we know that what people need right now, whether you're faculty or staff or a student, it's not one size fits all. Maybe some people are looking for updates from the region. Maybe some people are really intrigued by the conversation today and want to hear more specifically about peace building work in the organizations on the ground. Maybe people are looking for an American take on what's happening, hearing from former diplomats and ambassadors. Or maybe people are just looking to be connected with others across the country that are looking to promote the narrative that we are looking to promote, which is a narrative of peace and pro-solution. So with that being said, Ez and I both have business cards with us that have a QR code that will take you to a forum that we're using to try and gather this information to help shape our program in the future. We want our program to be student run and led and to meet the needs of where people are right now. We would love to talk with you after or connect online. And one of the best ways to do that is by filling out this form. It's really quick. It asks for a name and email and then has you rank some different options as to what you might be interested in engaging with to help us get a better sense of what our program can do. For for everyone that we are meeting on this tour. Um, so please come find us, talk to us after. I'll stand at the back and hand out a bunch of cards, but we would love to hear from you and create these connections. And again, thanks so much for being here tonight, and I hope everyone enjoys the conversation. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ellen. All right, let's start off tonight um, by just, if each of us can tell us why do you do this work and why now? And as because you're from Gaza, I think, why don't we start with you? Yes, of course. Uh, I do this work uh, because it touched me on the personal level as Palestinian from uh, the Gaza Strip. Uh, growing up in uh, Gaza uh, and living under the Israeli military occupation uh, and uh, coming to the United States and studying politics and going back uh, to Gaza, trying to be part of the Palestinian state building. And uh, unfortunately, you know, uh, when I was in Gaza, I witnessed uh, three wars, the war of 2008, 2009, and 2012, and 2014. And I was evacuated, being an American, I was evacuated twice by the US embassy out of uh, Gaza under fire. I do this work of peace building because the other alternative is violence. The other alternative is war. And I witnessed destruction and war in Gaza, and this is not uh, a way uh, to live. I'm here today with you preaching peace and bridge building, even though my house in northern Gaza, in Bitlahia, was uh, bombed and destroyed by the Israeli army, and my whole neighborhood 
El Khazan neighborhood in northern Gaza in Bethlehem village was also wiped out by the Israelis and I lost approximately around 80 members of the Masri family to the Israeli bombing. Those are civilians, not gunmen. That doesn't shake my belief that the only way forward is peace between us, the Israelis. Because the alternative is just continuation of war. And I don't want war for me, my kids, my family, and my people. That's why I do this work. Thank you. Good evening. Lisa, thank you so much. Uh, I would like also to thank the University of Notre Dame, to thank uh, the wonderful audience who are with us in this hall, with our, the faculty or the students. This also reflects how relevant and how important our issue, the Palestinian-Israeli conflict, when it comes to the international context. For me, as a person who was born and grew up in Palestine, uh, it is extremely important for me just this dedication and this work when it comes to the future of my people, when it comes to the future of our uh, new generation, to be dedicated and to work hard for the end of occupation and for realization of peace always based on the two-state solution. Uh, I was born in a small village in the Jordan Valley, and I'm living in Ramallah. And for me, even, even the drive nowadays between the two points which are supposedly taking in normal circumstances if there is no such obstacles and if there are no such checkpoints, it should be maximum 35, 40 minutes. Nowadays, it's taking this path or this tour more than two hours. We are, as Palestinians, going through a very hard reality, and we firmly believe that the only way is to get out of the status quo, which is non-sustainable and non-bearable. And the only way, actually, is to work as a peace camp, to coordinate also and work closely with the Israeli peace camp when it comes to the realization uh, of an end game settlement to the Palestinian-Israeli conflict. Why? Why now, within the context and the role of the international community and when there is such an ongoing war nowadays on the Gaza Strip when there are uh, such, you know, a violent reality in the West Bank also attributed to the settlers' violence, we believe always our voice should make difference when we are reaching out to the international community and to the international. So besides doing it locally in Palestine, we are uh, reaching out with this message to mobilize and lobby for an end game settlements because once again, we believe that the position of the international community matters and make difference when it comes to the ultimate solution. Thanks, Nita. My name is Teila. Um, I am from Tel Aviv, director, uh, deputy director of uh, Geneva Initiative Israel. I grew up in a religious Jewish family and uh, community, and our narrative uh, around the conflict was very simplistic. Uh, it was us versus them. We are good, they are bad. We want peace and life, they want death. It wasn't anything essentially beyond that. Um, and uh, the first time I, I really uh, met and spoke with, dove into the issues of the conflict with Palestinians from the West Bank, Palestinians from anywhere, was in uh, 2016 on uh, an intensive dialogue seminar. So when I say what we do works, I know from personal experience. 
Um, and it was the first time uh, that I realized that everything that I cared about and believed in, in terms of uh, the future of my people in what I consider to be our historic homeland, was dependent on the security and realization of rights of the other people who share the same historic homeland. That I, as an Israeli, cannot expect uh, real, lasting security and safety and flourishing in the land of Israel if Palestinians living in the historic land of Palestine do not have the opportunity for those same rights. And since then, I have been working uh, at the Geneva Initiative to uh, create the human infrastructure to finally move us uh, towards that moment where Israelis and Palestinians can live side by side uh, in peace and security. The most practical, pragmatic way that I see of doing that, and I'm sure we'll get into it uh, very soon, is a two-state solution, an Israeli state side by side with a Palestinian state. Um, and just a, a word about why now um, that Lisa started with. Uh, it's an incredibly difficult time to talk about peace. How, how do you talk about peace when you're in the midst of the worst war, certainly of, of my lifetime, um, and when the, the human toll, right, the catastrophic situation uh, that we see on the ground in Gaza uh, is such that, that many people, uh, particularly on the Palestinian side, but of course what I hear is from the Israeli side, people talking about their experiences, their losses from October 7th, um, is such that many people are not prepared to speak. They're not, they don't want dialogue right now. They, they might be willing to speak to me. I'm speaking about Israelis. Israelis might be willing to speak to another Israeli about solutions, about a political process. Uh, and even then, you know, there's a lot of uh, hostility and fear. Um, but to speak to someone from the other side, to speak to an enemy, uh, is, is something unthinkable for many, many people. And we're hearing that from international um, allies to one side or the other as well. And my response to that would be, is, <laughs> that now, now is the only time to speak about peace. You, you don't speak about peace and work towards peace when there is peace. You speak about peace and the need for peace, and you work on it in the depth of war, when the need has never been greater. Um, and yes, there, there are incredible obstacles to coming together. There are incredible obstacles to running productive, constructive dialogue uh, today. Um, and, and our job is to overcome those obstacles, uh, which, despite everything, we continue to manage to do. Thank you all so much. I wonder if you can help our audience today understand some of the work that you're doing to promote a two-state solution when there are other options on the table that maybe people aren't aware of. So there's sort of the, a one-state run by Palestinians, there's a one-state solution run by Israel, which is there's one state right now, it's, and then occupied territories. And then there's ideas about a confederation or sort of an overlapping state. Why do you all advocate for a two-state solution given the other possibilities or options? The two-state solution is uh, something uh, doable. Uh, it has uh, borders, and it has the support of the international community. And also, as a Palestinian, the two-state solution is the platform of the Palestinian Liberation Organization, the legitimate and the only representative of the Palestinian people. That's what the PLO had decided, that a two-state solution is a political uh, settlement uh, with Israel. Therefore, uh, I support uh, the two-state uh, solution. Yes. Yeah. You know, when we talk about uh, the two-state solution, the truth we mean uh, the establishment of an independent Palestinian state on the 1967 border side by side with Israel. We mean the recognition, the recognition from the side of the international community and the obligated recognition also from the side of Israel since there is an already existing state between the river and the sea and the still missing state is Palestine. When it comes to the other scenarios, I myself, I don't see the other scenarios as solutions, but rather, you know, as options, and it depends if we would voluntarily or compulsory end up with such uh, alternatives. 
And before I tackle the two-state solution, I would rather go through the other two scenarios. We have the existing reality scenario. We Palestinians in the West Bank, we are living in a, you know, a format of almost a one state where the Israeli settlers have the upper hand on the Palestinians, where the Israeli settlers do have the access and the control over the infrastructure as well as the different natural resources, while the Palestinians gradually and with time are ending up to be living in a closed bonto stance. A situation which for me, I'm strongly against, I will not accept, and I will continue working in order to change such a reality. When it comes to the issue of a, a democratic one state, you know, this is, this is an issue which we Palestinians do not see doable. And here is the difference, actually, between the way we see it, the ones who are working on the field, and probably certain other voices who have the desirability, which we do respect, to have a democratic, a one democratic liberal state with equal civil and political rights. But doable wise, for me as a Palestinian, I don't see it doable. And as such, I'm returning back to the two-state solution as a Palestinian. I'm also strongly interested to realize my national aspirations of a state of my own. I want to be in a Palestinian state, national state, where I can enjoy the full privileges of the citizens of all other states in the world. I want to have my internationally recognized borders, my flag, my theme. I want to be a member, a full member of the international community. Palestine now is recognized by the vast majority of the world countries, but the realization of the state is our responsibility and the responsibility of the international community too. Last but not least, you know, we deal with the public, with the constituency, with the Palestinians in the West Bank, in East Jerusalem, in the Gaza Strip. And based on the different public opinion polls and the different questionnaires and collecting answers back for the last couple of decades, we do not see any higher percentage of supports when we compare it to the two-state solution. I can refer to September 12 public opinion poll, which was conducted in Palestine by my organization jointly with other polling office in Ramallah. And when we asked about uh, three choices, the answers came as follows. On the one state with equal right, only 11% said yes, they want it. On a two-state solution, ending up with a confederation, 19% said yes, we support it. On the two-state solution, a Palestinian state on 1967 border, along with Israel, 51 percentage of the interviewees supported it. Ultimately, and automatically, this means that 70% of the Palestinians do support, actually, the two-state solution. Once again, there is, there is a problem also, even, even with, the, with the remaining 20% uh, it's only the fact that because of the different failures and the deficits of the Middle East peace process, they are confused on what would be the most proper and relevant solution for, the, uh, for this conflict. I believe what we need is an only one day of success. And once we can reach an agreement where the Palestinian state will be established, all of the Palestinians will stand strongly behind this choice and will stand strongly towards having a democratic state, a state which is part of the broader international community. 
So uh, since Nidal threw out the, uh, the numbers for uh, Palestinian public opinion regarding end game to the conflict, uh, I'll give the, the parallel uh, data on the Israeli side. This is from uh, a poll that we did through a professional polling company in August 2024. We put a lot of different options on the table. Uh, Two-state solution won a plurality of support at around 37%. Uh, a one-state solution with less rights for Palestinians, essentially apartheid, but we didn't put that word in because that would bias the results, uh, got between 20 to 25%. Uh, a one-state solution with equal rights for all got 6.6%. Uh, so lower than on the Palestinian side, not significantly lower than on the Palestinian side. Uh, but I do think it's worth highlighting that that discourse, that conversation about uh, a, a, a liberal, uh, democratic, binational state in Israel-Palestine uh, is a conversation that's mostly happening abroad. Uh, you just don't have uh, real grassroots public support for it on the ground among either Israelis or Palestinians. And that, that is worth keeping in mind uh, when we talk about productive, pragmatic solutions and paths forward from where we are today. Um, that 37% on the one hand is quite worrying because I don't have a, a majority in Israeli society today that says we are willing to make the compromises that we need to make in order to move for, forward with uh, the Palestinians towards statehood. Um, on the other hand, 37% is also shockingly high. If I asked a room of Israelis right now, how many, what percentage uh, of Israelis do you think support a two-state solution? 5%, 11%. Uh, I can tell you one thing about the peace camp is we're very good at thinking that we're the minority even when we're not. Uh, so you actually have close to 40% still, despite all of the trauma, and Israeli society is living with a lot of trauma right now, uh, despite the fear and the hatred, saying, when I step back and think about end games to the conflict, what makes the most sense really is still a two-state solution. For me, it's very simple, and this is what we present to our participants constantly. You have two peoples in this land between the river and the sea, and both peoples have national aspirations and a right to self-determination. At that point, right, either you can go for a binational state or you can go for two states. Binational state has close to no popular support. Uh, and as, as said earlier today, so what, you want me to serve in your army? Right, what, what would that look like pragmatically uh, on the ground when you put that together? I have no actual clear idea, a clear path towards that version of reality, what I can see very clearly are one of two paths. One is a two-state solution, incredibly painful compromises made by both sides, but finally, finally, uh, we come to uh, a scenario where neither side is killing each other and we have basic rights and dignity. Or we continue this conflict, we deepen this conflict, Right? Each side continues to claim uh, maximalist goals. It's ours completely. And the next Oct October 7th, I'm speaking from the Israeli perspective, is not just around the corner, but it's, it's even worse than what we have already seen. Uh, and that is what we are trying to bring to Israeli society, that awareness of now we are at a crossroads. It's a hard argument to make when you're still in the middle of a war. Um, but we do see, and I think it's worth now expanding the conversation to opportunities. Uh, moments that did not exist in the past, uh, political shifts and cracks uh, that can be leveraged for a picture of our region, a picture of the Middle East that we haven't been able to even dream of for the past 10 years. All right, so earlier I showed a slide which showed uh, this diagram of power being balanced and in dialogue and um, increasing trust in relationships. Is there a, a role for protests to support Palestinians to increase sort of public awareness and uh, to balance the power? What do you think the role of protest is? Is it just about dialogue or is protest necessary too? Protest like a protest uh, in the international arena, in particular in the United States and Europe, or protest in uh, the Gaza Strip and uh, the West Bank? Anywhere. Protest uh, is just something that is very important to raise your voice against uh, injustice. I remember uh, as young as uh, 15 years old uh, taking uh, part in protest in uh, Jabalia refugee camp in northern Gaza against the military occupation and going 
forward when I was in high school leading protests also against uh, the Israeli uh, occupation and uh, remembering the Israeli army breaking uh, into our high school and beating up uh, the students, myself and the teachers. So protest is uh, something that is important in order to raise your voice. That said, uh, protest here in the United States, for example, mm. protest on campus in support of uh, Palestine and Palestinians and against what's happening in Gaza is also very important. Uh, however, as a Palestinian from the occupied territories from Gaza, I would have liked the slogans, for example, in the protest to be uh, different and uh, to be uh, asking for uh, demands and requests that can be uh, doable. Uh, for example, it would have been very strong uh, for students and U.S. campuses to come out uh, with the demands and requests, for example, like ending the military occupation, uh, demand from the U.S. administration to recognize the state of Palestine and the 1967 borders. Uh, those are uh, demands that can be uh, uh, done and can serve us, uh, Palestinians in the occupied territories. For us in the occupied territories, Gaza and the West Bank, our main and number one request and demand is to remove the Israeli military checkpoints, uh, to end the military occupation, uh, to stop the Israeli uh, settlements in Gaza and the West Bank, uh, to allow for us Palestinian to have land and geographical contiguity for us to have our own state, like Nidal uh, said. Uh, that's what we uh, expect in the occupied territories from the solidarity movement and from the protest. Mm, thank you. You're yeah, the truth, uh, hardly you will find a Palestinian who, didn't, who do not believe or who do not practice the exercise of a protest uh, when it comes to the occupation and when it comes to refusing the reality. It's our mean and our uh, tool to amplify our voice in order to be heard uh, by the whole world and by Israel. It's uh, protesting, by the way, is a nonviolent mean, uh, non-militarized non way to express uh, a position. So it's extremely important and definitely it should continue to be uh, like this and in order to defend and mobilize a certain cause and in our case as Palestinians we are uh, defending and mobilizing for our right to have a state of our own and to end occupation. Nowadays it's being practiced even you know there is this war uh, in Gaza but in the West Bank, for instance, there are daily protests. My, my, my son is studying in a university at Birzeit University, and sometimes I find him returning back during the mid of the day. So I ask him why there's no education. He said, no, no, today we are protesting this case because there is a rest of 10 students, for instance, mm -hmm. or the students are unable to arrive at the campus. So, in, in, in response to that as a reaction, the ones who manage to arrive at the campus, they don't study, but they go, they go protest. Protest around the world for end of occupation, for peace, for justice, and for the realization of the international humanitarian law, and for the universal declaration of human rights when it comes to the Palestinians and when it comes to the situation in the, in the West Bank and in the Gaza Strip and East Jerusalem is also, you know, an, un, an unviolent way. And I believe it serves the agenda of peace and it serves the agenda of the peace camp in both Palestine and Israel as far as such a protest do not go violent. Mm -hmm. Um, I, I have protested the Israeli government more times than I can count at this point, so I would be very hypocritical if I uh, stood up now and said that I think that protests are wrong. Um, I do think that in any protest movement, um, strategy is critical, um, and thinking about framing 
is critical. Um, I have at this point engaged in protests which were very effective. Those are few and far between. And protests that essentially didn't accomplish anything. That's the majority. And uh, protests that actually were quite harmful. Um, I'll give you an example. Uh, Sarah Netanyahu, who is the uh, wife of uh, our prime minister and kind of a hated political, quasi-political figure within certain circles in Israel, um, one night in Tel Aviv went to uh, get her hair done um, and uh, it was leaked somehow that she was in this particular neighborhood in Tel Aviv uh, and within an hour, two hours, there were thousands, maybe 100,000 Israelis uh, outside of this barber shop screaming bloody murder at this woman. Not very effective. <laughs> and if anything, quite harmful, I think, to the movement because the movement, the, the protest movement looked like maniacs, right? Um, we, were, we were screaming against this woman who technically is not an elected official, no matter how much political influence she has. Uh, the prime minister got a nice photo op with his wife afterwards hugging her and saying, thank God you're safe from these you know, crazy protesters. Uh, and in terms of what it did to the mainstream, the way they thought about the protest movement, the way they thought about us, uh, the slogans that were captured on television being shouted uh, at the woman at the event, um, overall, that night, I would say, hurt us more than it helped us. And I think that whenever you go out to the streets, there, there, is, there must be a, a very clearly defined goal, and then the means as well, what you are saying, who you are inviting in with you, who you are keeping out. And that can be a decision. You can say, you know, I don't want this kind of person to be invited into this tent on this day. I, I would argue that it's always better to, to widen the tent as much as possible, but that can be a strategic decision that you make. Um, and, and that said, right, just, just know what you're doing. Be, be very strategic about it. Um, because it's incredibly difficult to make protest effective. Sometimes it works, and then it's incredible. It's rare, but it, it can be done. If you want to move beyond protest for the sake of, you know, keeping, maybe even keeping yourself uh, feeling like you're doing something, at least, you know, I, for, for my own uh, sense of self and values, have come out to make this statement, fine. I think that's also that's important to build community and build a sense of solidarity, a feeling of I'm not alone, uh, given the, the state of the world. Um, but if you want it to work, then you need very, very careful strategy. And that goes down to the details of what are you saying, right? What are the slogans that are being shouted? To what are the demands? And is this clearly being communicated to the rest of the world? Does everyone understand why I am here right now? And I... I would argue that some of uh, the protests, certainly what we've been seeing uh, of some of it uh, back in Israel, the communication of values has not come through uh, as clearly as it should. And that's also obviously you know, our media's responsibility. Um, but when, when you go out, right, think about how am I being seen and is this accomplishing the goals that I want it to accomplish? Mm. Thanks to each of you. We're going to open it up in a minute, so there'll be uh, microphones here. But one final question for each of you. You've come all this way to the United States, and you're touring campuses. What do you want from us? What could we be doing? What should we be doing to make sure the status quo doesn't last, and that there is real just peace and coexistence? Yes, of course. Uh, American university campuses are very important uh, places uh, to uh, highlight the urgent need to end Israel-Palestine conflict. Mm. And uh, we've seen how uh, the uh, student uh, movement in the United States was effective during the Vietnam War and how American university campuses exerted pressure and American uh, decision makers to make them stop the war in Vietnam and bring American soldiers back to the state. So for us Palestinians from the occupied territory, uh, we would love for American campuses uh, to continue uh, to highlight the urgent need to end the Israeli military occupation and also to send a clear and a loud message to Washington to the President, to Congress, to the Senate, 
that this occupation needs to end. 57 years of military occupation is unjust and it needs to end as soon as possible. No one deserves to live under a foreign military occupation. It robs you of your dignity and humanity. Help us Palestinians in the occupied territory end Israel military occupation and realize the two-state solution. Israel and Palestine live next to each other in peace and economic prosperity. Thank you. Thank you. Lisa, besides to what I just have mentioned, we are, we are on the verge actually of a new critical and a crucial stage in the status and situation of our region, Palestinians and Israelis, and within the broader context of the Middle East, with a new president coming to office, it's extremely important for us to see a strong public opinion among or within the campuses and within the broader American public and such public opinion to be echoed on the process of policy making when it comes to the American role within the context of suggesting responsible, reasonable, and relevant plans for solving the Palestinian-Israeli conflict. The deals of the century type plans never been relevant and will not be relevant in the future. Nowadays, there is this risk of the annexation of the West Bank. And yesterday, the Israeli Minister of Finance, he said, Trump is back, and the 2025 will be the year of annexation. This means a Trump can allow the annexation, and the Trump can prevent the annexation, because this guy, by his own, cannot make it unless he will get the green line from the United States. We want to prevent, actually, such a green line, and we want to prevent the annexation, and we want to maintain the ambient conditions for solving the Palestinian-Israeli conflict based on the two states for any time in the future. I think um, it's very natural for people to feel um, more empathy, more identification with one side or the other. Right? You're pro-Israel or you're pro-Palestine. Um, and that's either due to actually having roots in the region, cultural, natural, sometimes family, uh, friends. Sometimes it's ideological, right? When you hear the narratives of the conflict, uh, you identify one side as uh, much more just than the other side. Uh, sometimes it's uh, a familiarity, a resonance between whatever the most important pressing political issue is within your own country and what you see unfolding uh, in our own region. And whatever the reason is, uh, I think it, it would be unreasonable um, to expect people to let go of that and to say, no, I'm not pro-Israel, I'm not pro-Palestine, I'm, I'm, you know, equally pro both in some way, and it would be very hypocritical as well, because I think every, everybody sitting on this stage um, right, has uh, the interests of, of one side uh, in particular at heart, and that's why we're here, not out of altruism, but uh, for our own people and for our own people's future, ultimately. Um, that said, I think what is so missing when I look around the world uh, today and when I hear echoes of our conflict narratives thrown back at us, uh, are allies who will say, yes, I'm pro-Palestinian, or yes, I'm pro-Israel, and I'm also pro-solution. I also want to talk about where do we go from here. I'm never going to agree with the other side about what happened in 1948, and actually I'm never going to agree with the other side about what's happening today, completely, right? We can, we can talk, we can come to some level of understanding, but at the end of the day, uh, the, whether it's because of the way the news portrays it uh, or the way the basic narratives and values have been inculcated, I am never fully going to agree with the other side about the past. But there must be, there must be voices from around the world that are encouraging us, that are showing us the way forward towards a shared idea of the future. And that's the vast majority of the work we do, is we bring Israelis and Palestinians together and we say, we're going to talk about the past, we're not going to ignore it, and we're not going to agree, probably. But 
at the end of the conversation, it can't end there. It cannot end with, right, here are our differences and here are our issues and here are the things we will never overcome. It must then move to, and now what? Because without that conversation, all we're doing is perpetuating the conflict. And I don't think there's any single person in this room who would say that that is what they want. Mm -hmm. All right, so let's now open it up and have questions from the audience. There should be two microphones. There's one over here. Uh, can, you, can you come back down, actually, because the, the hands are back down here, sorry. Uh, in the middle, in the black, and then um, in the blue. But, so you'll be second, and then two, wow, three, four. Hi. Um, thank you again for everything. Um, my question is uh, about uh, territory in the two-state solution. Um, the 67 borders, Gaza Strip, assuming something will remain of Gaza Strip, um, and West Bank, how it's going to communicate, and uh, Jerusalem, how it's going to go inside this uh, very positive um, solution that you're suggesting. Thank you. Can you the map? Uh, I can pull the map back up, yeah. Can we, can we answer? Or? Yes, go ahead. And well, answer. Okay. Uh, the territorial aspect is extremely important. And when we talk about the two state solution, mainly meaning a Palestinian state, we mean the territories of the West Bank, which is dotted as shown in the map. We mean the Gaza Strip, and we mean East Jerusalem, which is uh, the red uh, dot, the large red, red dot, and here it's, you know, inside inside uh, the Palestinian territories. So, the land which is occupied in 1967 is the land which is supposed to be the future space of the emerging Palestinian state, but. Based on the different round of negotiations between the Palestinians and Israelis, there are uh, certain, certain issues and certain components which we need to take into account. First of all, the connectivity and connecting the Gaza Strip with the West Bank. So, uh, a safe passage have been integrated to connect the nearest point between the West Bank with the nearest point with the Gaza Strip. This is what we call or try to describe as the safe passage, a passage where the Palestinians from the Gaza Strip and the West Bank can use easily, smoothly, and freely to move between the two sides. In addition, probably such a connection can also serve as a place for any other infrastructure which can be needed. The second component or the second issue is the settlements. We all know that we have a certain, certain settlement blocks or a settlements which are close adjacent to the border line and other settlements which affect substantially the geographic contiguity of the future Palestinian state. All settlements that affect the future contiguity of the future Palestinian state will be evacuated. When it comes to certain settlements which are adjacent, whether in Jerusalem or adjacent to the border line, there are certain proposals to deal with them within the principle of the land swap. The principle of the land swap, which was integrated into the literature of the Palestinian-Israeli negotiations in 2001, became part of the official Palestinian position. So far, we have certain marked settlements which can be part of the land swap. Meanwhile, we know on the map which are the areas, more or less, to be given to the Palestinian side. In this regard, I believe, you know, probably not all of you are aware about this territorial aspect, but a percentage between 2.5 to 3.8 uh, as an area to be swapped between the two sides gonna 
fulfill the dire need on the ground while maintaining the geographic contiguity and overcoming the issue of certain set Israeli settlements. And maybe I'll just add on that because I know that settlements are considered uh, a main point against the potential viability of a two-state solution. If you look at a map today of the West Bank, uh, with the locations of all of the settlements and outposts highlighted, uh, Abu Mazen, Mahmoud Abbas, president of the uh, Palestinian Authority, famously said, it's Swiss cheese. They're, they're everywhere. There's holes in the West Bank, and it's a real threat to Palestinian contiguity. Um, but what Nidal is talking about with that uh, between 25 to 3.5% is the fact that 80% of Israeli settlers today are living alongside the Green Line still. So all of those different points, all of those outposts and settlements deep within, they have much smaller populations than the major blocks that are still right along the line. Uh, and the settlement movement, despite trying quite hard over the last few decades, has not managed to significantly shift the bulk of its population deep within the West Bank. So you're obviously going to have uh, a, a political issue when you talk about uh, evacuations on the Israeli side, and whatever prime minister finally gains the courage to do so will pay a significant political price. But that said, in terms of the viability of it, of the actual bulk of human beings who you have to evacuate, we are talking about well under 50%, uh, because most, the vast, vast, vast majority of Israeli settlers living within the West Bank today are living right along the Green Line. And if you have the territorial swap that Nidal mentioned, uh, you don't actually have to move them from their home. Let's take another question. Actually, let's go on this side, and then we'll come back to you. So if you can bring it up. Hi, thank you so much for joining us today. Um, I'm a Palestinian refugee from Yaffa, uh, which is occupied Tel Aviv right now. And I'm wondering how the right of return would look like for the Palestinians in diaspora and uh, who were expelled in 1948. And I'm wondering uh, how you think the Palestinian leadership would look like without colonial interference. Thank you. Yes. So I'm also the descendant of a Palestinian refugee. My mother is a Palestinian refugee of 1948. Uh, she comes out of the Abar Galil from the city of Safad. Uh, there is nothing uh, us Palestinians uh, would like to do than, for example, uh, practice the right of return to all these uh, villages and all uh, these cities. But uh, as a student of uh, political science and uh, uh, peace uh, building, I understand that uh, there is a difference between uh, total justice and uh, political settlement. And uh, as Palestinians, we are not individuals. We are people. And we have institutions that represent us, including the Palestinian National Council and the PLO. And the PLO, for the sake of ending the state of war, for the state of resurrecting the Palestinian people and have a state under the sun for us Palestinians and to end the military occupation, they made the painful uh, decision in 1993 uh, to opt for a two-state solution. Israel, Palestine, based on the 1967 borders, and like Nadal said, with the mechanism of land swap. Palestinian refugees, and any Palestinian around the world, once we have our state, the independent Palestinian state, all Palestinian refugees around the world are welcome to come back to the state of Palestine. They will be naturalized citizens within a couple days. They will become full-fledged Palestinian citizens. Uh, and uh, again, we are uh, as Palestinian people, uh, our main objective is to end the Israeli military occupation in the Gaza Strip, the West Bank, and to have a Palestinian state. Thank you. Do you want to follow up? I see you shaking your head. Yeah. Um, no, I'm not sure like, uh, how we can... Uh, agree on the Palestinian uh, group or like the Palestinian people in general. Like it would be very nice to have a two-state solution, but we all know how Oslo ended up, um, how, it, how it ends up being 
for the Palestinians at least. Can you say a little bit about that? So, so the, the Oslo Accords, uh, when they happened, uh, they were supposed to, first of all, grant the Palestinians uh, the right, like the whole point was to like have a two-state solution in a way or another. But then uh, what ends up happening is uh, all these gray areas no one knew about, the borders were not 100% uh, agreed upon, and the Palestinians end up being greatly disadvantaged uh, in that way. So I'm just a bit critical about how that process would look like at the moment. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else yeah. want to respond? Go ahead. Yeah. You know, you know, we tried, we tried to uh, a bit highlight the, the territorial aspect, but we're the ones who are working actually on the ground on the territorial aspect. When it comes to the borders, definitely there is a, a way and there is a strong chance to draw a clear border line between, between the two states. But back to your first question and to connect it actually to the future solution of the Palestinian-Israeli conflict when it comes to the issue of uh, the Palestinian refugees. By the way, you are American citizen. Where, where you came from? Jordan. Ah, Jordan. Uh, okay, uh, th then this is easier for me, actually. Uh, you know, I'll, I'll, relate, I'll relate you back to the official Palestinian position and you know the most, the most common and popular position when it comes to the issue of refugees. First of all, the issue of refugees uh, is being dealt with at two levels. Level one is the return. And level two is the compensation. And every Palestinian refugees, according you know, to the different rounds of negotiations, which we had in the past and which we anticipate to have, Every Palestinian should enjoy both rights, the right to return and the right to compensation. When it comes to the right to, uh, the right to return, there are also, you know, the right itself and there is the implementation. And within this, there is a set of choices which have been developed actually by the Palestinians to some extent acknowledged by the international community and the right of the return includes the following. First of all, the unrestricted right of Palestinians to return to the future Palestinian state. Any Palestinian can return, whether he's in Jordan, Lebanon, Syria, Iraq, the United States, Venezuela, or where, wherever. So the right of return to the Palestinian state is 100% guaranteed. But if there is Palestinians who prefer to stay in the host countries and there are according to the definition of the honor war, which is unfortunately in a hard situation because of the policies of the government of Israel and the fact that Israel is trying to cancel the agreement with the United Nations for allowing the honor war to work, there are three countries which are considered a host countries, Jordan, Lebanon, and Syria. And then it's up also to the Palestinians who are living in those countries if any of them will choose to stay in the host countries. According also, or referring to the broader context of negotiations, there are two other choices. The return to the homes, not homes because there are not any more homes, but to, the, to their original places, and the choosing a third country as a final destination of residence and citizenship and nationality. And this issue, Israel should accept an average number of the numbers accepted by other countries. We are talking about, uh, you know, it's hard always to talk about the refugees in Jordan because the refugees in Jordan even a bit sensitive uh, since they are enjoying a full political and civil uh, rights in Jordan, but a bit, you know, better when we talk about the refugees in Syria and Lebanon, we have a better track as Palestinians to how many Palestinians we have in Syria and in Lebanon, at least actually until 10 years before the Arab Spring. But within this package, we believe we can allow in a way or another a fair a formula where the 
Palestinian refugees can choose between the right of return and compensation, combine both together. And I, I just want to say a word about um, Oslo because it, it's frequently cited um, actually by both Israelis and Palestinians as evidence that uh, a two-state solution can't work because look at the failure of Oslo. And I think it's really, really important to remember that Oslo was not a peace agreement. It was not a final status agreement. Oslo was an interim agreement. It was uh, a uh, series of decisions made, agreements come to by both sides that were supposed to end after five years uh, in a final status agreement on all of the core issues of the conflict. But what essentially ended up happening was they agreed on these interim measures and they never set the end game goals. So they said, you know, things like refugees, we'll decide later. Borders, we'll decide later. Jerusalem, we'll decide later. So <laughs> instead of taking Oslo as uh, evidence that uh, a two-state solution peace agreement would never work, uh, I, I think what we need to take from it are lessons about how a two-state peace agreement should work, right? That you need to, from the beginning, state clearly, this is our end goal, and we are going to start talking from the very first day about the core issues that, up until now, have essentially fueled uh, this incredibly bloody conflict and come to agreements on where we want to be five years down the line and not just say, five years down the line, we'll start talking about it and figure all of it out in a few months, because clearly that did not work. Thank you all. Let's go to the next question. Uh, this past spring, American universities saw a wave of protests, uh, but they were mostly focused on the boycott, divest, and sanction movement, which you didn't mention in your list of different things that you want Americans, or the world, to be protesting about. Um, so I'm curious for what your take is on both the effectiveness of the boycott, divest, and sanction movement, if that's something that we hear on the US side should keep advocating for, or if there's, if you prefer, I guess, um, other more effective ways to protest and campaign. Mm -hmm. Who wants to talk about yeah. BDS? <laughs> Go ahead. Okay. Uh, listen, uh, uh, boycotting and uh, BDS and uh, et cetera is uh, something that is uh, nonviolent. And uh, of course, we would like in the occupied, and this, is, and this is our message from the occupied territories, buy, cut, and divest any products that comes from the occupied territories, the West Bank and the Gaza Strip. Anything that is made in illegal Israeli settlements inside the occupied territories, buy, cut it, divest from it. That said, when it comes to the State of Israel, okay, inside the State of Israel, okay, I'm not calling for a divest from uh, anything that is done inside uh, Israel or boycott Israel. Because inside Israel, our problem as Palestinians are not with the Jewish people or the Israeli people in general. Our problem with the extremists inside Israel our problem, Palestinians and Israelis, are not between the Palestinian people in general and the Israeli Jewish people in general. The problem is between extremists in both sides. And those extremists feed on each other's actions and reactions. And us, the silent majority inside Israel and Palestine, we are victims of those extremists. Thank you. Anyone else want to talk about video? Well, no, I endorse what, uh, what Ez just has said. It's extremely important uh, to boycott whatever is relevant to the occupation and its tools in the occupied Palestinian territories in 1967. And all practices, actually, that aim towards bringing uh, a final settlement closer through using sticks or carrots, I believe this is, this is extremely important. We are facing this problem uh, in Palestine specifically when it comes to the fact that the Israeli settlements in the West Bank are also an economic venture. It's a very beneficial economic venture which finds its 
final destination and markets in the Europe and in the United States. So the most importantly is to divest it and to uh, boycott it. And this is the best service you can make to the peace and to the chances of realizing the two-state solution. I just a very quick clarification, because as said, uh, any Israeli products from settlements in the West Bank or Gaza, there are not yet Israeli settlements in the Gaza Strip. So, in the West okay. Bank only. only in the West Bank for now. Let's go to the back there for the next question. Um, hi, my name is Francesca. I'm a PhD student in Peace Studies and History, and I also have a master's degree in Holocaust and Genocide Studies. Um, I um, would appreciate reflection on sort of three different either terms or sort of historical happenings. Um, so the first is um, the end of apartheid in South Africa. Um, you seem to think that that's not sort of a space for inspiration or a model. So I'm wondering if you can reflect on that. And then the other two um, are the terms and realities of genocide and settler colonialism. Thanks. Okay, thank you. I will reflect on the issue of uh, apartheid. Uh, <clears throat> our problems in the occupied territories is not apartheid and is not equal treatment between Jews and Arabs. This is not our struggle in the occupied territory, meaning Gaza and the West Bank and East Jerusalem. We are not fight. Our fight is not for equality between us and the Jewish people. Our fight, our struggle is for liberation. We want to be separated from Israel. We want to have our own state, our borders, our national anthem, our flag. We want to live Christians and Arab Muslims in a Palestinian state. So South Africa model, you cannot drop South Africa model just the way it is over Israel and Palestine. South Africa model belongs in South Africa. Our struggle is different. Our struggle for independence. We want a Palestinian state. We don't want to be equal with Israelis. Israelis can stay in Israel. We want to stay in Palestine, have our own state. And what about Palestinian citizens of Israel? Palestinian citizens of Israel, that's their struggle. They need to fight for equality. Two million Palestinians inside Israel, they need to fight for equality inside Israel and for full integration inside the Israeli societies. They have rights, but in the same time, they have obligations. And they need to be citizens of the state of Israel. We are calling for two states, Israel and Palestine. The Palestinians inside Israel are full citizens of Israel. They vote in the elections. Out of 120 seats in the Knesset, they scored 17 seats in the Knesset. So it's their fight for quality. It's their fight to be integrated in the political system. And also, it's their obligation as two million Palestinians inside Israel to help us in the occupied territories from inside the Israeli parliament. Thank you. What about Mizrahi Jews? Mizrahi Jews? For us Palestinians and Arabs? And the two-state solution. Mizrahi Jews are Arab Jews. They lived among the Arabs for hundreds of years. We expect from the Mizrahi Jews to be supportive of us Palestinian Arabs. Mizrahi Jews, they understand the Arabs, we understand them, they lived among us, and we expect from them to support our struggle for independence. That's what we expect from the Mizrahi Jews. Others of you want to talk? Apartheid, is it he, relevant? He answered apartheid. Yeah, so I'm just asking if you want to add anything to it. Uh, no, maybe I'll, I'll say a couple of words on uh, genocide, because she mentioned also the genocide, no? Uh, last, May, last May, there were a ruling by the International Criminal Court, the ICC. I myself, I very much into uh, the. the court of Justice. Sorry? It was in the International Court of Justice, not ICC. Yeah, yeah, International Court of Justice. No. Uh, there are two, two tracks the ICJ, which issued the advisory opinion on the legality of the occupation. And there was also the ICC. The two, there are two tracks. Yeah. The, the court which uh, considered the issue of genocide is the ICC, not the ICJ. 
No? No, the, the ICC is uh, Gallant and Netanyahu and Sinwar. It's uh, the arrest warrants, and the ICG did both. But it has not done. No, but it's, it's, Tehila, do you want to speak to that? And also sure. just yeah, to throw out there that like no. every genocide studies scholar pretty much at this point agrees that it's genocide, including genocide but, studies scholars at Notre Dame. Never mind. Let me tell you something. There were, there were this set of measures which have been published by the court. Among them uh, is the main responsibility of Israel vis-a-vis -vis the Palestinians, and the Palestinians have been defined as a group which is eligible within the broader context of the uh, sovereignty and jurisdiction of the court and the applicability of the issue of genocide. This is one. Second, the court ordered Israel to ban from the forced displacement of Palestinians to allow uh, humanitarian aid to Palestinians and not to incite for genocide. This is, this is you know, the, the four or five points which have been published. Uh, it's extremely important, actually, for Israel to comply by all these measures. But most importantly, for the international community, actually, by the way, there were uh, 15 judges, 15 judges who took part in this uh, hearing, among them there were a judge who represented Israel, and on a three of the five points which were issued, even the Israeli judge did not oppose. There are other judges who oppose, but they were, uh, the, the decision have been taken by, you know, uh, a, a majority of, of votes. So, it's extremely important to allow the court to continue the work and to make the final ruling when it comes to the situation in the Gaza Strip. And the final ruling must be respected by the rest of the world, must be also taken seriously and implemented when it comes to uh, the UN and the UN Security Council, as well as when it comes to the United States. We are not collateral damage, Palestinians. We lost around 46,000 in this war in the Gaza Strip. I personally lost 80, 80 of my extended family, the Masri family. I'm not talking about gunmen. I'm not talking about civilians, women with their babies, grandfathers and grandmothers. Israel killed approximately around 45,000 in Gaza. Not all of them are Hamas or Jihad al-Islami. More than half of them are civilians. And who committed the crime of killing civilians will face persecution. And they need to face the consequences. Period. I'm not here to defend anybody. Thank you. Well, I'll go to a question here and then two down here, just so it's going to take a while. Oh, well, first, thank you very much, Professor Scher, for holding this excellent event. Um, my question is, in, in order to end the occupation, you would need security in these areas. And, and given the devastation, security is hard to be found. And so I've seen a variety of different ideas put forward about how to secure the area, perhaps in the short term, perhaps even longer, that would include other states like Saudi Arabia, the UAE, other Arab or Muslim states coming in, Egypt, who knows, yeah. to secure the area. And, but you had mentioned that you wouldn't want a foreign occupier. And I wonder, these are not democratic states. They might impose a gender apartheid on the region. Would that be acceptable to the Palestinian people to have a state which didn't offer rights and freedoms and justice, but instead was similar to these other states where people are denied those things? Would that be an acceptable Palestinian state? Of course, when we talk about the future Palestinian state, we want to have a plural Palestinian state. We want to have a democratic Palestinian state. We want to have a Palestinian state with an institution. That said, today, us Palestinians, we need help in particular in the Gaza Strip. Uh, the Gaza Strip was ruled by Hamas for over 17 years, following a bloody military coup against the PLO and the Palestinian Authority. In the Gaza Strip, we lived 17 years under Hamas uh, rule. 
with the persecutions and with people being arrested and etc. So now with Hamas regime in Gaza is vanishing little by little. And uh, what we need, we need help from our brothers in the Arab countries, in particular from Egypt, from Jordan, from United Arab Emirates, and from Saudi Arabia. The combination of these uh, countries uh, and their help is essential for us, especially when it comes to security and training the Palestinian Authority uh, security personnel, hopefully in Egypt, and Egypt facilitating their entrance into the Gaza Strip through Rafah crossing. Now, uh, I would never uh, endorse a regime in Palestine that persecute the Palestinian citizens or a regime that is not democratic. But currently, at this stage, in our uh, struggle for a Palestinian state and for independence, we need the help of the Egyptians. We need the help of the Emiratis. And uh, what is uh, most important is for the efforts of these Arab countries to be coordinated with the PLO and the Palestinian Authority. Once the PLO and the Palestinian Authority sanction these countries and they will work with them, okay, then the, we will not consider this a foreign military occupation. The foreign military occupation is the Israeli occupation. The Arabs are going to come to help us. Yes. Anything you want to say? Y yeah. Over the last few decades, actually, uh, even with the uh, issue of Palestine emerging, there used to be always this partnership and support from the side of the Arab countries. The fact that uh, countries like Saudi Arabia, Egypt, or Jordan will help and provide the Palestinians with a consultancy, with a certain technical support or financial support, but always they are also providing us with a political backing. This won't mean automatically that those countries will rule in Palestine. We Palestinians, we always say that we do not intervene in the internal affairs of any country. So for us, it's not our issue whether such states are democratic or non-democratic. The most important for us as Palestinians to have the state which we dream to have, a state which is democratic, where power can be exchanged through elections, a state that can respond to the needs, to the desires, and to the rights of all citizens equally. So this is what we want, and definitely we should not be affected, actually, by any practices of any failure state, if any. The question was what Palestinians would be willing to accept, so I'm actually not exactly. going to. I mean, I'd love to hear you do it. Do you think that would be acceptable to the Israeli side to have this coalition of Arab states to guarantee security in the region? Do you think that would be? I, I think it's Israel's dream, right? I think uh, right now, for most Israelis, when you ask them what's their greatest threat, it's, it's not Hamas, it's not even Hezbollah. For generations now, it has been Iran, right? That's the, the great threat in the region uh, from the Israeli perspective. Uh, and the only way to, uh, to have any kind of deterrence against that, credible deterrence, is through uh, a strong regional bloc that uh, is coordinating together, cooperating uh, to protect uh, everybody's security. And you cannot achieve that until you have fixed the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. Uh, so until right, the, the Saudis have said over and over and over again since the start of this war, we want normalization with you. We're willing to move forward. We need a Palestinian state. We need some kind of pathway towards a Palestinian state. And given the composition of this government, it's something that Netanyahu, despite the fact that that is his foreign policy legacy, that's, that's the crowning achievement of his lifetime if he can't achieve it, uh, he can't commit to it. He can't even pay lip service to it because he is so dependent on his extreme right-wing allies in government who have said no Palestinian, not even lip service. We're not willing to even contemplate the idea of this. Um, I just want to say a word uh, in, in response to uh, the various terms that were uh, thrown out. Um, 
my feeling coming here um, and, and having now uh, spent a week, a little over a week, uh, on various college campuses is that uh, the terminology litmus test is incredibly important here in a way that it is not back home. Um, we were at a uh, conference in DC. I was on a panel with uh, several uh, Palestinians, including a Palestinian peace builder who has spent every single day um, of her life since the war broke out trying to achieve a ceasefire and trying to work behind the scenes with Israelis to move us closer to uh, an end uh, of this horrific conflict. Uh, and an American woman in the audience uh, who has no direct roots in the region, uh, but who cares passionately about uh, Palestinians and about Palestinian life, um, essentially took her aside after the panel and berated her for not using the word genocide, for not using this terminology or that terminology. Uh, and the woman, the Palestinian woman, turned to her and said, stop telling me how to make peace. Um, and, and that, I think, you know, there, there's, there are reasons, there are strategies, there are choices for the words that we use. Sometimes it's ideological, sometimes it's about being able to reach our own audiences. Uh, and from what I've seen here, uh, there is a certain level of ideological purity that uh, certain groups are not willing to compromise on. And that stops uh, some people who are actually on the ground trying to build peace and trying to build bridges, stops them from doing their work or prevents their work from being as effective as possible. Um, so I, I would urge you, uh, you know, as you're thinking about what is important to push here, to consider putting words aside and think, put, put in the center actions. Because that is, from, from my perspective, actions are much more important than the terminology that we're using. Thank you. Thank you. again. <clears throat> Thank you guys for coming. Um, so I have a question and <clears throat> I kind of want to challenge your thoughts and, and my, my opinion as well because I share somewhat of the similar opinion in the sense of um, when, when you split up, when you create this two-state solution with the 1977, 1967 borders, um, Jerusalem is in that respect for the Palestinians. And now we understand the Israeli project to start as a, Jew, as a goal for, for Jewish people to arrive at their homeland with Jerusalem being the gold pot, I guess. Right? Jerusalem is the most holy site um, for Jews and Muslims. But yet, Israelis would have to compromise that, that holy land, that Jerusalem. So do you see that as not, I guess, a contra contradiction to, to the or origin of, of the Israeli project? And, and if so, are, are Israelis willing to compromise at that if, if, it's, if, that's a, if that's the root of the Israeli project? Great. Um, some Israelis are not, are not willing to compromise. And, and for them, it's land above all else, including life. Um, we know who those groups are, um, and we know that they've gained strength, particularly political strength, uh, over the past years. We also know that they're a minority. Um, we know that demographically, we know that from public opinion polling. Um, when you can put a viable peace agreement on the table uh, and present it to Israeli society and say, here are the Palestinian partners for peace on the other side, when you can make that case, then you will have a moderate majority, a pragmatic majority in Israeli society that is ready to sign. It's happened in the past and it will happen again in the future. You're then going to have spoilers coming up from within Israeli society that do. They, they, um, the sanctity of land is of uh, such paramount importance to them that they are willing to go very far, including violence, uh, in order to prevent any kind of uh, compromise on the territory. They have been um, overruled in the past, for example, from the disengagement uh, from Gaza in 2005, um, from the disengagement from Sinai in order to make a peace agreement with Egypt. And what we know is that every time that um, Israel goes through a bilateral peace process with a partner on the uh, other side, whether it's uh, Egypt or, uh, or uh, the Palestinians in Oslo to some extent, uh, then you have uh, an agreement that lasts. Oslo arguably has lasted way too long. Um, and every time Israel goes through a, a unilateral process 
where Israel decides without consulting, without negotiating, without trying to give uh, power to the moderates on the other side, um, then that has actually led to more violence. So one of the claims we hear in Israeli society is, well, look, we disengaged from Gaza, and then we got rockets. And obviously, there's a Palestinian response to that about why that has happened. Um, but what, what we say as Israelis speaking to Israelis is, that wasn't a peace process, right? You didn't do that out of the goodness of your hearts. That was out of security considerations because Israelis were dying every single day in the Gaza Strip at one point. Therefore, uh, you know, there was a choice made at the governmental level not to sit down at the negotiating table, and, and that has a cost. Hamas was seen as the diplomatic winner uh, of the Israeli disengagement from Gaza. Uh, anytime you can have an actual bilateral process where you can raise support within Palestinian society from the Palestinian actors at the negotiating table because look, finally they're delivering on our dream. Uh, and you will also raise support from the pragmatic uh, Israeli voices, which is still the mainstream majority. They just have to be able to visualize it. And because of our circumstances right now, both the war and, and uh, I would say just as importantly, the kind of leadership that we are saddled with, uh, it's incredibly hard to do so. By the way, just to elaborate a bit on Jerusalem, the issue is extremely important. Uh, Jerusalem consists of East Jerusalem and West Jerusalem. And East Jerusalem is the territory which was occupied in 1967. And then the Israeli government annexed East mm -hmm. Jerusalem and subjected it to the Israeli uh, sovereignty. Mm -hmm. Nowadays, even, even when we look at the city, despite the different uh, demographic and geopolitical uh, complications which have been created since 1967 until today, the city is divided. Still, still East Jerusalem, with a vast majority of Arabs and Palestinians, and the West Jerusalem uh, with purely, purely Israeli. The solution for Jerusalem to serve as two capitals for two states is possible, doable, and can be implemented actually on, on the ground. Uh, we mentioned the Geneva Initiative, and within the context of Geneva Initiative, we presented, we presented a formula, a formula for solving the issue of, of Jerusalem. In a practice, in a practice, Jerusalem can be divided, can be a shared capital, can be also as a third option as an open city, meanwhile to serve as a, a capital for both states. The world area, the world area, and the one kilometer of the religious places, there is also a practical and relevant formula to divide, but also to ensure the safe and secure access, the followers of the three religions, mm -hmm. each to its chosen place. Yes. All right. We have one more question down here, and then one right behind it, and then one on the side. Assalamu alaikum. Well, thank you for being here and for this uh, great talk. Um, Salam. So you guys, the Palestinian side, have seemed to come representing the PLO um, and the PLA. Uh, I'm curious about the other Palestinian organizations uh, that represent other groups in Palestine and kind of what your stance is on how they can be integrated into this conversation and how their perspectives should be taken in, especially because I feel that many um, Palestinians do support Hamas as a legitimate organization and one that has resulted in severe consequences, but in a way also elevated the issue to the global stage that it currently has now. Um, All right. So what's your response to that? Well, thank you. Well, you know, the PLO, the PLO is the agency, actually, when it comes to the Palestinian political representation. Definitely, we are firmly believe in inclusion and including all different Palestinian political parties within this agency. You mentioned, you mentioned Hamas. The only obstacle for Hamas not to be part of is you know, the ideological platform of Hamas. We do not fit with the charter of the PLO. Over the last 20 years, there were several attempts, actually, to bridge the gaps between the two sides. And for Hamas to give up on certain components of its own charter and to uh, tune itself within the PLO charter, this is, this is the only way for Hamas to be uh, integrated within within the PLO. 
There are, you know, several also rounds of internal Palestinian uh, talks towards realizing an end to the intra-Palestinian split. And this is also supposed to lead to a certain formula where, where all the different spectrums of the Palestinian people will be represented. The PLO charter is very, is very clear. PR, the PLO charter presents the Palestinians as a part of the broader international community. It enjoys the recognition of the whole world as the sole representative of the Palestinian people, and the PLO follows and adopts the non violence and the peace towards realizing the goals. So this is what is needed for the rest of the Palestinian groups to be integrated and included in this PLO agency. All right, thanks. We have a couple more questions and not much time left. So let's take um, this question and then one over on this side at the same time. Can you ask your question and then we'll take this one? Uh, yeah, uh, thank you all for coming. I really appreciate it. Um, I just had a question, um, so like, kind of going off that, I guess, I was going to ask, like, um, how would the PLO integrate a group like Hamas, especially given, I'm sure they don't speak ideologically for all the Palestinian people, but they have explicitly rejected Israeli statehood, and they have said, several of their leaders, including Khaled Mashal, have said that they won't stop until uh, everything from the river to the sea is free. So how do you uh, integrate that sort of group with the broader uh, move towards peace or truce. So when we talk about the PLO, the Palestinian Liberation Organization, it's, it's a coalition of almost 13 Palestinian factions. And uh, as Nadal said, the PLO is the sole and the only legitimate representative of the Palestinian people. Now, organizations like Hamas uh, is uh, ban Islamic organizations not necessarily uh, only focus on Palestine and Palestinians and building a Palestinian state. We, we in the PLO, we would like Hamas to become a pure Palestinian organization uh, and its only concern is Palestinians and the well-being of the Palestinian people. Uh, Hamas needs to get in line with the PLO uh, political position uh, uh, on Israel and on the final settlement with Israel. Hamas alone as a political party or movement cannot stand in opposition to 13 political parties and factions. Those are the PLO, including Fatah, the biggest Palestinian uh, organization. In the PLO, we would welcome Hamas to join. We would welcome Jihad al-Islami to join the PLO. However, they have to adhere to the character, to the charter of the PLO and the political uh, vision of ending Israel-Palestine conflict and to the international uh, community. Thank you. You're welcome. We'll have two more final questions, one here and then here, and then we'll call it. Thank you very much for this very insightful panel. Um, so along the same lines, I wanted to ask, um, what, what do you plan to do in this ideal state solution with uh, groups that simply won't recognize Israel and countries in the region that simply won't recognize Israel as well? Uh, you mentioned two of them. There are splinter groups in the West Bank. And I can count at least five in the core Arab states of the Middle East that haven't recognized Israel and then in North Africa, elsewhere. And can you give us a kind of a count of how many are there? How many Hamas people are there? How many Islamic jihadis are there in terms of actual numbers? Thank you very much. Yeah, well, I mean, you know, in the end, it's us Palestinians that need to decide what kind of country and what kind of state we want. And we refuse. Any country, Arab or Muslim country, or any country around the world, to say we accept this or we don't accept this or we would like you to do this. This is none of their business. Starting with Iran. As Palestinians, we decide what kind of state we want. And for now, the PLO decided that we want a Palestinian independent state 
on the 1967 borders with East Jerusalem as its capital. That's what we want. And for Hamas, yes, Hamas is a big organization. Hamas is uh, maybe the second organization among uh, Palestinians in Gaza, the West Bank, and the diaspora. Hamas is not a small organization. And Hamas is part of the Muslim Brotherhood. It's a bigger organization that was established in Egypt back in the 1920s. So, and Jihad Islami is on the payroll from Tehran. They get paychecks every month from Tehran, okay? So when they become purely Palestinians, they will join the PLO. Same thing goes to Hamas. Yes, thank you. Let me, let me just add, add one thing, sorry. <laughs> Uh, you, know, uh, you know, I, I'm coming from Ramallah, and I'm uh, very close uh, to the political conversation, including also uh, the truth. You know, I'm aware about the political conversation with Hamas, which has taken place over the last couple of weeks, including last week in uh, Cairo, and the fact that Hamas uh, endorsed the administrative committee which will be in charge for Gaza. And Hamas said, uh, we endorse it. It will be led by the PLO, by the PA. Uh, we are fine with it and we will. Uh, th th this is because Hamas know how severe the damage which have been created in the Gaza Strip. And they know that they won't be able to deal with it. They don't have nowadays neither the tools nor the, th the support or even the presence on the ground. But when it comes also to the political solution, over the last few years, uh, Hamas never said that they don't want the two-state solution. Those guys, they said that the other side don't want it. And even, you know, in a couple of statements made by Khaled Mish'al, he said that he will be fine with the Palestinian state on the 1967 border without any reference to whoever will be beyond. So this is, this is initially, and uh, for that being said, and not to uh, appear as, as defending Hamas, I want to say, based on the different media reports and the different, you know, even direct conversations with some friends who are journalists and talk to Hamas people in Doha, Hamas people in Doha, they are not, not happy with the situation in Gaza. They are not happy with the whole thing which happened in the Gaza Strip. And nowadays, they are also looking for a savior and for a window of opportunity to get out of this situation. And they firmly believe that the only one who can make it is uh, President Mahmoud Abbas. Mahmoud Abbas, although he's the weakest, they believe that he's the savior nowadays. He's the guy, but he doesn't want. Nowadays, he doesn't want. For him, he is interested also to see Trump in office and to see what are the new policies to be taken by Trump. And for him, he needs a strong regional and international endorsement when it comes of him returning back to the Gaza Strip. But the problem nowadays is not on the side of Hamas. What is just uh, had said also, unfortunately, there are two, two people or two countries nowadays in the Middle East who are against the two-state solution. It's Iran and Netanyahu. They don't <laughs> want it. Yeah, they don't want it. I, I want to I push back a little bit against that. It's true that you have specific Hamas officials on the record saying they would embrace, they would accept a Palestinian state on 1967 borders. Uh, they never said that they would accept a state of Israel along 1967 borders, and that's an important part of the equation, right? It's always seen as a 1967 state until we get further, more of what we want. So on the Israeli side, Hamas certainly is not seen as uh, a partner for peace. If that changes in the future, fantastic. Um, I mean, it's going to be very hard to persuade Israelis that it has really changed. But, you know, if you can have credible signs and steps, then great, they can be integrated into the PLO. Um, what was the last thing you said, Nidal? Ah, about the, the uh, opponents of a two-state solution. Yeah. Yes, and. <laughs> um, I would say that uh, one, one of the um, slogans circulating through Israeli society today is, a Palestinian state is a prize for Hamas. 
that this would, similar to the disengagement from Gaza, right, this would actually strengthen them. This would be something that showed them that uh, their attack on October 7th uh, had accomplished something great for the Palestinian cause. And what we say within Israeli society, what our organization is saying back is that a two-state solution, a real two-state solution, with all of the, the core issues settled, end of all claims, uh, is Hamas's worst nightmare because they ultimately represent this maximalist vision of all or nothing, total Palestinian control. Maybe the Jews can remain, but with a, uh, an inferior status within the land, within the country. Um, and, and that's exactly what our extremists are saying and are, are trying to uh, promote and accomplish. Uh, so what we're saying is, if you want to truly defeat Hamas, Right? Militarily, we've done uh, essentially as much as we possibly can, in my opinion. Uh, and the way forward at this point is you have to defeat the, the idea of Hamas. You have to uh, defeat them on a, a diplomatic playing field. And the way to do that is to show that uh, the pragmatists on the Palestinian side are right, that there is a possibility for compromise, that there is a, a future side by side with Israel both living in peace and security. Uh, and, and that ultimately is the only way to truly delegitimize, to truly fight uh, the extremist maximalist vision uh, is to prove that there's an alternative. All right, let's have a final question. Uh, I, the last word. Uh, I think it was just mentioned a moment ago, but uh, what is Iran's role in this whole situation? I mean, it's the <laughs> elephant in the room, and I'm reminded because they mentioned the other Arab countries yeah. in the area which are trying to help. But Iran seems to be very interested in maintaining this, this disorder. So could you help us understand, as, as, as Americans, what's really going on there? Well, Iran, until 1979, you know, prior to uh, the uh, Khomeini, Ayatollah Khomeini uh, revolution, uh, was a very good friend of uh, Israel. They were best friends, Iraq, the Shah of Iran and uh, Israel. But things changed in Iran uh, when the Ayatollah regime uh, came into effect. And their first thing was they wanted to export their model of Islamic revolutions to who? To the Arab countries around. And for example, I grew up in Gaza during the 70s and the 80s. Gaza was uh, more progressive than the West Bank. Uh, however, once uh, Iran started funding uh, in uh, Gaza uh, Jihad al-Islami. Uh, things started uh, to change in Gaza, becoming more conservative. And then when they started to fund Hamas uh, in the 80s and the 90s, things took uh, also uh, a sharp uh, turn toward Gaza being more conservative. Uh, and, and you could see that, the, 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 uh, you know, with the closure of the cinemas in Gaza and the theaters in Gaza, and the woman becoming more wearing the hijab and the black dress instead of the Palestinian traditional uh, dress. So all these uh, changes happened. And what complicated things more is Israel, I mean, uh, Iran adopting Hamas and Jihad al-Islami and they're sending them money and weapons uh, through the Sinai Desert, especially I'm talking about Gaza, and making Hamas and Jihad al-Islami even stronger than the PLO and the Palestinian Authority, uh, to the extent that uh, Hamas staged its military uh, coup against the Palestinian Authority and the PLO and drove both out of Gaza. So Iran empowers Hamas empowers Jihad al-Islami and make them more powerful than the PLO and the Palestinian Authority combined. That's what Iran is doing. And uh, this for us in Gaza uh, proved to be uh, disastrous. You know, with Hamas thinking that now with the Iranian support, they can take out uh, Israel. And uh, Yahya Sunwar, I believe when he decided to do that, the terrorist attack on Israel, he was really counting on uh, Iran's uh, support uh, somehow. And uh, apparently, uh, you know, Ismail Haniyeh, head of Hamas, was assassinated in, uh, in Iran by the Israelis. And now we see Iran and Israel exchanging rocket uh, uh, you know, fire between the two countries. 
And the Iran is just, the regime is destabilizing uh, the Arab countries, starting from Iraq, Syria, Lebanon, and Yemen, empowering the Shias against the Sunnis. In Syria, they do that. In Lebanon, they did that. In Iraq, they did that. And in Yemen, with the Houthis, installing the Houthis in, in, in Yemen. So the regime in Iran is destabilizing those Arab countries, one. And two, empowering the extremist, maximalist, radical elements within the Palestinian people. Uh, and that uh, is destructive for us Palestinian moderate who just want to have an into the occupation and to have a negotiated two-state solution. All right, thank you all so much. I have a few announcements, but before I get to those, let us just thank the panelists for traveling all this way. Thank you for your honesty and your courage and your willingness to say hard things. Dialogue is not simple or easy.